Good afternoon. We've still got people streaming in and that's great. My name's Raylene Knowles. I'm the COO at IGEA and, and we just want to thank you all for coming today and, and thank you for bringing such positive energy. It's great to see you all in person again and we hope that you've enjoyed today. I'm really lucky because I get to introduce our closing keynote today and, um, and it's the fabulous and the ambitious Joey Egger. <laughs> I've been privileged to know Joey and meet Joey through the IGEA membership and, I, and Joey also sits on the IGEA board as well. Joey genuinely believes in the work that all of us do, both at IGEA and in the industry. Joey contributes, she walks the talk, and she understands the important impact that the work you create actually makes. This keynote is going to be fabulous, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Joey. No pressure. No pressure. Hello. <laughs> Thanks, Raylene. <laughs> um, so I begin today by acknowledging the Kulin people, traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I also extend my respects to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Um, so I'm Joey Egger, as Relian said, I'm a Managing Director of Family at Two Bulls, which is based in Collingwood. Um, I have a 20-year career in kids' digital media and have won some cool awards along the way. Um, GCAP invited me to do a keynote about my career journey and what ambition means to me. So I started thinking about what does the word ambition even mean to me? Um, and so I like to procrastinate a lot. I might have still been working on this speech today. Um, and in that moment of procrastination, I went into something that I'm super curious about right now, which is text to image AI. Um, so I wanted to see if that could visually help me understand the word ambition and what it means to me. Um, so ambition, no, two male. Uh, let's try ambition women. Nope, too corporate. <laughs> ambition, Sesame Street, that's me. <laughs> so after spending too much time on that, and I mean too much time, on Dali, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, going down that curious rabbit hole, I realised that the word ambition was not really reflective of me. Um, so I thought I'd do a talk on what curiosity is to me. So what does curiosity mean to me? It means leaning into things that fascinate me, giving things a go, even if it's a bit scary, like this talk, um, and understanding that failure is a part of curiosity and it's simply knowledge gained. Uh, without a clue, prelude to my life. So this is gonna be a story about my career, sorry. Um, so I'm originally from Sydney, when I was a teenager in high school, I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to be and I didn't even know who I was. I don't know if anyone else felt like that as a teenager, but I didn't have a sense of self. I didn't, there were so many people who were very cool, but that wasn't me. Um, but there were a few things that I was extremely curious about. I was extremely curious about things that I didn't realize would be formative, Commodore 64, for my future career path. Uh, it was so cool and amazing, wasn't it? Um, and then early text-based adventure games like Zork. Um, this is when I was in primary school, I have to say. And the stories on the computer, on my Commodore 64, that were interactive. And the computer actually responded to you with sass. Like, if you swore, it'd tell you off. It was amazing. My mind was blown. It was so fun. Um, and as I got older, I got really obsessed with Japan. Um, I, read a book called Sadako and the Thousand Paper Cranes and that just hooked me onto Japan and I was obsessed with it for years. Um, now people talk about university as the time that they find themselves and it's the most formative years of your life. Not me, I still hadn't found myself yet um, and because I had no idea what I wanted to be or what I wanted to do, um, I somehow fell into a Bachelor of Arts degree at Sydney University which all my friends uh, called the degree you're doing when you're not doing a degree. Um, and I chose subjects that excited my curiosity, but they weren't really career-defining paths. So I did Japanese, Irish Gaelic, old Irish Gaelic, 
Um, so if anyone needs to know how to get to um, Cork near Gurkey, I, I, I will tell you. Tome ni kone ni Cork. Um, business language of the future, guys. Um, when I graduated, I suddenly found myself without any education cushion whatsoever, but I could speak a bit of Irish Gaelic. I found myself without a job and without someone who was advising me or telling me what my, less, my next step in life was meant to be. Chapter one, wax on, wax off. So through a friend, I managed to get a job at a company in Sydney called Infomedia. Infomedia transformed printed car part catalogues into a software that allowed you to search for and order parts via a computer. And it was actually really cutting edge back then. I was employed as the image cleaner. So all day, every day, I scanned old books of car parts. I actually found some of this online. It's amazing what you can find online. It's just amazing. Um, and I had to import it into uh, Photoshop. I think it was Photoshop 3 at the time. And I spent my day cleaning dirt off these scans because they still have bits of dirt when they're in the printer. It sounds really boring, but I frigging loved it. I was so curious about computers and programs like Photoshop and how everything was made. I just soaked up as much information as I could. So I called it my wax on, wax off introduction to digital. Um, slide story. Back then, if you had one license for a whole office for Photoshop, you waited until it got to a certain point in the loader, it pulled the ethernet cable out for three seconds, put it back in, that's how you got to get Photoshop. <laughs> I had a really wonderful boss called Ian Joycey, uh, who was the Chief Technology Officer, and I just can't believe I looked at the camera while he was doing that. <laughs> and then he encouraged me. Ian encouraged me to learn computer technology, so while I was just doing Photoshop, he was like, I want you to learn about computers, play computer games. Um, he encouraged me to play, with, play um, Doom Land with the engineers during breaks, which was like mind-blowing to me, because you guys were in an office, at your separate computers, but you could play together. It was like insane. Um, and then Ian would like tell me that everything, even the most boring tasks I, I would do in life, like that Photoshop job, even mopping a floor, would help me in my future jobs. And he was so right. And he was so good as a first manager and I really hoped I could be like him one day. Um, so what I learned from Infomedia was even the most man mundane tasks can help you in your future career. Uh, computers rock, and engineers are awesome to work with. Um, chapter two, following their curiosity. So for years, as I mentioned, I'd been really super curious about Japan, and um, my obsession got me a job with a one-year contract at ABC English School in a small city in uh, Chikoku. And um, at the airport, it hit me as I was landing, um, that I was about to send, spend an entire year in a country where I literally knew no one and no one knew me, and I was absolutely on my own. And if I wasn't so obsessed and curious about Japan, I think my terror would have gotten the better of me. Um, but I had to force myself out of that comfort zone, and uh, I think my curiosity and my obsession with Japan just pushed me through everything. Um, ABC English School was a small private English school for rich people and their kids, so basically I was a glorified babysitter. There was no lesson plans, they just told me to make up my own shit. Um, so I created lessons in a way I only know how to do, and that was through playing games um, and making stuff up as I went along during the class. And I had a lot of young students and they loved my classes and they earned, learned English through play really well. And I loved making up games and teaching them English through this. Um, I had some adult students and I quickly learned I was not so good at teaching adult students and teaching the traditional methods. So I leaned into the play and I like, understood that that was something that I was not good at, was the traditional method. Now there was this one kid called Satoshi who came to school with a singular focus. He was super curious about websites and he really wanted to do a computer programming course and learn about coding but he, he realised at a young age he needed to learn some English, so he asked his parents to come to the school. So I was like, this is actually a really good opportunity 
let's make this kids class really interesting. I had been exposed to some fundamentals of coding at my last job, but I didn't know much. Um, I knew I could create fun, weird lessons out of anything thrown my way. And um, Satoshi's request actually made me even more curious about how websites were built. So I decided that Satoshi and I would learn HTML together in English. So I crafted lesson plans around the end goal of building a web page and publishing it. Over a few months, we pulled apart existing websites like Space Jam or something like that to see how they were built. We, built, we learned to build a basic website together and he also learned English along the way. Um, and this experience got me even more curious about websites and technology. And I often wonder about Satoshi and um, did he actually make it into engineering? Maybe he's that Bitcoin Satoshi? Um, in any case, I hope I helped him follow his curiosity into a career and he certainly helped me follow mine. So I really, really appreciate that Satoshi. So curiosity, a recap of my life. Commodore 64 got me curious about computers and technology. Cleaning off dirt scans of car part illustrations in Photoshop got me curious about digital production. I was really good at teaching kids through play-based learning. And a kid named Satoshi taught me that helping people follow their curiosity can help you follow yours. Oh, and don't go on live radio in Japan for an interview in Japanese and suddenly forget all your Japanese and freeze at the first question and spend the entire interview on radio in silence. True story, but at least I gave it a go. Um, chapter three, let the production assistant deal with it. Okay, so uh, I got a, my first foot in the door, my first real foot in the door in digital in Sydney, but first I had to go through a, a few other jobs at the ABC. Um, I was a transcription typist for the um, history of rock and roll. I think it was, I can't remember what it was called actually. Um, then I became a production assistant for um, the 2000 Today Millennium Live broadcast. Does anyone remember that one? Was anyone around? Um, it was a Millennium Consortium of 60 broadcasters from around the world doing a live telecast of the Millennium as midnight hit the different cities. Um, and as part of that, the ABC was slowly introducing these things called websites. And, well, they knew what websites were. And um, not many people at the ABC really understood how they worked or they were just too focused on the TV or radio side to actually even um, want to do anything with it. So what happened a lot was, um, in all the different departments, get the production assistant to manage it. Manage it. Most of the production assistants were women. Um, and so they put us... Um, on a three-day website development course. And uh, a lot of us are still in digital media jobs today. Um, and they, there's a lot of senior uh, female digital people at ABCs around Australia. And uh, a lot of them were in the same situation that I was in. Um, by the way, I found this on the internet. This looks like shit, but this is the first web page I ever built and got like officially paid for it. It was for the 2000 Today website. Woo! And, um, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and I just can't believe I found it on the website and it just, I actually teared up a bit when I found that on the internet. Thank you, um, Wayback Machine. Um, after the Millennium program wrapped, I got a job as a production assistant, once again, at Media Watch uh, with Paul Barry, who was on it back then as well. Um, and back then he was known as the thinking woman's crumpet. <laughs> and he certainly was. Um, <laughs> I had more formal web management of the site, so I was still the production assistant, but they still got the production assistant to manage the site, and I oversaw the daily updates and managed the guest book. And I really loved the act of managing a website and the whole production cycle, even though it was a TV production cycle, making sure that the website synced with the TV. It was really cool. Um, but also, Media Watch actually gave me my first like light bulb moment, and it helped me find my focus, which was kids and digital. So, play-based learning plus HTML plus managing a website, and I was like, I think I found my focus. Um, and I then, at this point, while I was at Media Watch, knew that I wanted to focus on kids digital, 
And so the sum of my curiosity journey to date showed me my path forward. So it became relatively, still hard, but relatively easy once you have a focus. Um, so about six months later, I had the opportunity to start at two jobs. One was ABC Kids Online as a web developer, and the other one was a director's assistant for live studio performances. Um, and I literally had this career crossword roads. Um, at the studio hallways outside Studio 22 in Gore Hill, the production manager um, walked up to me and she was like, Joey, you have to make your decision right now. And she literally, I had to make it on this crossroad in, in the um, studio building. And so I chose kids, because that was my focus. And I still remember her saying, looking me directly in the eye, and she's like, that, that's, those websites are going nowhere. You've made the wrong decision. And then she walked off. <laughs> but I followed my focus. It was OK. Um, so my first job at ABC Kids was as a web developer. Um, there was no CSS at the time. Lots of tables. I can do tables real well. Um, I, was a, I was working on um, lots of websites and the playground website, um, and a lot of it was post focused on play-based learning. So there was lots of educational elements in it. It was really meaningful to me. I was in heaven. Um, we were embedded within the TV department, the ABC Kids TV department, because there was no digital departments back then. So we were just like part of the TV crew, which was awesome. Um, our our um, meeting room had Jemima and all, you know, Big Ted and Little Ted in there. It was pretty cool. Um, online didn't have formal structures and processes as it does today. So we all had many hats. So I was a web developer. I was a producer. I was a horse forum moderator. <laughs> I was an illustrator. Um, and then, you know, I learned a lot of things, but I started to focus in on um, producing because I, I really liked that part of just doing lots of, lots of things. Um, and in, in 2002, um, ABC decided that they needed to age up their kids' website offerings and they tasked our little team with creating a website for kids 7 to 12, so they were ageing up. And back then there was little interference, so there was a bunch of us, um, including uh, someone who's now my husband, uh, who I hired, we pretty much came up with everything. Um, but also people starting to take note about websites finally, which was really great. And that actually meant that we were able to collaborate with all the different departments at um, ABC. So we got lots of um, input from science and music, Triple J, um, and sports, and we were able to create some really cool content. Um, so Roller Coaster and Playground became the number one and two most popular kids site, websites for kids in Australia, which was pretty cool. Um, and because of that, Roller Coaster actually as a website, then turned into a TV show, which was uh, a first of its kind, with Elliot Spencer. Don't know if anyone remembers that show. Woo! It rhymes with toaster. Um, and with Roller Coaster, we started working on older, I, I swear there's a meaning for this part. We started working for, on older sites for kids, like um, Degrassi, The Next Generation. And Out There, which was, no one knows, but it was awesome. It was done by Sesame Workshop. Um, going back to that radio moment, if you ever make a fool of yourself on live public radio in Japan because you suddenly forget all your Japanese and you freeze for the entire interview, um, that weirdly gave me confidence. Um, and it was a massive learning moment for me because it actually taught me that Everything is easy if you're speaking English. <laughs> like this talk, I'm not speaking Japanese. Um, and so it actually gave me more confidence to try bolder and bolder things. So I guess that's where a bit of ambition actually comes into my curiosity. So I was like, I'm really curious about these companies that we were working on who did these websites with us. Um, Snap Media was a company in Toronto who managed the Degrassi site. And Sesame Workshop, who does Sesame Street, um, also do other TV shows. So they did this show with ABC Australia called Out There, as I mentioned. 
And I really loved what they both did and they both inspired me so much and I really wanted to like know what, how they did everything so well. So I got a little bold and um, I, I contacted my, um, I told my contact at Sesame Street, Glace Chow, that I was visiting New York. I wasn't. Um, and could I drop by and visit her for a coffee while I was in town? Um, and then I told my contact at Snap Media I was visiting Toronto. I wasn't. And could I uh, uh, drop by and visit them for a coffee while I was in town? And they both actually said yes. So I quickly had to request time off work and book some flights. Um, so I was just like making this all up as I went. Um, so uh, I got to know these people. I got really valuable FaceTime, which is really super important. And we didn't talk about work or anything. We, they showed me around. We just had good chats. We had more than coffee. We had quite a few drinks in both cities. And um, it's just about getting to know each other. But that FaceTime is really important. And um, I think post-COVID, everyone, a lot of people are starting to forget that. But it is really important just to get to know people in person. Um, so in 2005, I was feeling restless. And I asked my contact at Snap Media if they had any producer job openings. And I heard back five minutes later, and it was literally like, um, where can you start? So I moved to uh, Toronto in six weeks, and I was a producer for a year on websites for North American TV shows, obviously my favorite, which was Degrassi. Um, Degrassi, by the way, side note, is actually a, um, the school itself was the studio, so the, the whole set was an actual school. So if you went to the toilet, you would go to the toilet where Spike on TV would be smoking a cigarette. Um, so that was really cool. I got to meet Drake when he was a kid because he was a star in Degrassi back then. He was very nice. Um, then I returned to ABC in Melbourne um, and immediately started working with my friend, with my colleagues on a show called uh, Five Minutes More. And this was a little um, show that I don't think it ever did really well, but it was really gorgeous. And we had some lovely TV producers who really wanted to try something new with websites. So this actually looks a bit shit at the moment, but that's because it was in flash and that was actually cutting edge back then. So, the, so we, we did what we could, but um, uh, this was produced by uh, co-production with ABC and Jim Henson Productions. Um, so that got me uh, another kind of foot in the door when one day one of the Jim Henson guys forwarded me this job opening um, for Sesame Street and was like, that's your job, that's exactly what you do at ABC. And I was like, oh my God. So I literally applied for it like at you know, one o'clock in the morning as soon as I got the email. Um, and I just wrote and just sent and uh, I got the job. So again, I moved there in six weeks and I ended up living in New York City for 14 years. Um, I worked at Sesame for six years. I want to show you our office. Okay, so this is our office. These are my colleagues. Cookie Monster, he was a bit of a dick. Um, this is my desk. Why am I pointing down there? That's my desk. Uh, I was actually hiding behind that during filming because I didn't want to be in the shoot for some reason. Um, and that TARDIS is my TARDIS, and that actually became a social media little thing because there was a big conspiracy that um, Sesame Street and Doctor Who were going to do a co-pro <laughs> because of my TARDIS. <laughs> um, so I was the senior producer on the Sesame Street Great Makeover of 2008. It was a massive endeavour, and um, I scoured the offices, I had to scour the offices for thousands of pieces of video content from old film, beta, VHS tapes from 1969 onwards. And then we all had to tag them in a brand new CMS. So everything was not digitized at Sesame Street and we had to get it all done. We also had to build in a matter of months, 30 flash games, 120 mini games, and hundreds and hundreds of interactive playlists that mix the mini games with the video clips that created interactive and educational experiences for preschoolers. Um, because it's Sesame, they created an awesome website promotion, so I'm gonna show it to you now. And I found this on the internet too, crazy.
They don't make ads for websites like that anymore. <laughs> um, there was also a daily video produced for the website front page. Um, so they created, um, I think, a year's worth of daily videos in Flash. Um, just before Flash died. And so a broadband studio was actually set up in the offices um, right near me for the filming of Muppets, which was fun. With that, we got to work on some really cool games that um, allowed us to intersect the, the show, but also show clips with um, interactive play and learning. One of my favorites was uh, OK Go doing a game for us about colors. One of the last Flash games we ever made. Yeah. Look at his little, little bum. Little bum. <laughs> so it was about mixing colours. It was really cool. And it was based on a, a song that they wrote just for Sesame Street. And then we also did um, experimental stuff like creating an interactive YouTube game about sinking or floating with Cookie Monster. Um, and then we also got to explore really fun new technology during this time. Um, so while I was at Sesame Street, um, touch screen phones and tablets started happening, death of flash, birth of HTML5, um, augmented reality, virtual rea reality, and all this other great technology um, was really fun to start exploring because we were able to explore it based around how to help kids learn through new technology and not just kids, preschoolers. Um, so we had a lot of wins. The first, one of the first institutions was Sesame Street to do a research, and, uh, a research paper on how preschoolers use touchscreen phones, and they kind of set the standard for how preschoolers use tablets and phones. But we also made some very stupid mistakes, like not heeding people's warnings about how quickly Flash would die a very horrible death, and you're suddenly left with 300 Flash games that you have to convert and pay a lot of money for. Um, we won an Emmy, an, a Peabody, and a Webby for that website, um, but it wasn't because we were really ambitious and wanted to win awards. It was actually because of um, curiosity of myself and this guy called Jay um, that we actually even entered them, because there was all these people around the offices who just literally had like, like 20 Emmys just sitting around their office, and uh, we were like, H how? And um, so we found out that there was no like department who submitted entries and we found out that um, people just kind of did it on their own. It was a lot less organized than we thought. And then we discovered that there was um, a website category that had just come up for um, the latest Emmys. And so we um, applied, we submitted and we won an Emmy. And I think the word Sesame Street had something to do with it, but you know, um, so that was really cool. Um, and then during this time, I became friends with this really tiny little Australian digital company called Tubals. And I got to know them and brought them in. They were my vendors for a couple of projects at Sesame Street. And they really excited my curiosity because they were specialists in um, stuff like augmented reality. And we worked really together figuring out how to do some fun things with um, Sesame Street characters. Um, and augmented reality and a few other different things. Um, and how to do it through, again, play-based learning. So uh, in 2012, I decided to take a bigger leap and uh, leave Sesame and actually move to this little company called Two Bulls, who um, had a small office in uh, New York but ended up growing pretty well. And we ended up uh, working for many years in this Dumbo office. Right right on the right here where it says hair, that was the entrance. Um, so it was a really cool experience, um, except uh, when I was trying to win work as the kids person, um, a, a few people have heard this story before, but in America when you say two bulls as an Australian, it sounds like two testicles, two balls. Um, so everyone was, just, everyone was just like, why, why is your company named two bulls and you're doing kids stuff? Um, so, we had to create a brand for the kids' work, so we called it Two Moose. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, quick recap on uh, where curiosity has gotten me in my career. Um, so I got very curious about technology because of the Commodore 64. 
Um, I got very curious about tech, uh, digital production because I cleaned dirt off scans of car parts illustrations. I love teaching kids through play-based learning. Um, a kid named Satoshi taught me that helping people follow their curiosity can help you follow yours. Um, I found my focus, kids in digital, and that became my North Star, that became my focus. Um, at Tubals, we started to do some really cool stuff um, with uh, second screen technology, and we started to do lots of um, innovation prototypes for shows like CES. Uh, we also started to do um, health tech for kids, so we did a thing called uh, Smileyscope VR for a startup, which ended up winning us a Webby. Um, and we did really uh, other interesting things like um, Penny the Pirate, uh, Ali's in the house here somewhere. Um, <laughs> and that was the first, um, it was the first medical tool that helped parents test their children's vision as they read them a bedtime story. And it was a book and an app. Um, so kids would get their eyes tested without even realising it. And that campaign was done with Sachi and Sachi and um, OSPM and Melbourne University and it won over 100 awards which is pretty great. Um, so in Melbourne currently, we're having lots of fun with um, a lot of games still. We do lots of stuff for um, American broadcasters who look at um, uh, TV shows that are educational. Um, PBS is a big one. Uh, we keep working with Sesame Street. A big one was the um, uh, 50th anniversary app we did using uh, ABC's latest version of augmented reality, including um, some stuff we did with Cookie Monster and Occlusion AR, which um, got us onto, oh, we also did Wiggles. Um, and so the Occlusion AR actually got us on stage at one, of the, uh, at one of the Apple keynotes, which was really cool. So that's our Cookie Monster there. And I think some of the team who worked on it is down there. Um, and currently we're doing some interesting stuff with um, places like TPT Twin Cities and also looking uh, out to uh, places in Asia. So we're now working on a financial literacy program for kids, but now it's focused in um, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, so we're really enjoying that. Um, so the thing is, I'm very curious right now about AI and text-to-image and stuff like DALI, Midjourney, and Stable Diffusion. I'm not doing much with it yet, it's just I'm fascinated by it and how this technology can apply to play-based learning for children and how this technology has the potential to completely change the way that the next generation is going to have to think creatively, but that's for a future talk. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to end by saying Lean into your curiosity. Don't be afraid to give things a go, like this keynote. And uh, failure is always knowledge gained. Thank you. Thank you, Joey. That was a great way to round out the day. And for me, it was a bit of a trip down memory lane because uh, my career in games started with kids as well. But we called it edutainment in our day. So you were doing the fancy website versions and I was dealing with boxed product. And Saddle Club was not a game we could print enough of, ever. So, um, and, and I also remember the Millennium Broadcast. I do, I absolutely do. I remember watching it with all my friends. We were, we were just relieved we didn't die that day. We all survived. You know, the millennium bug. We may have been slightly hungover, but we, we survived, so it was good. So thanks, Joey, for that great talk, and you know, I think you really inspired us all, and, and I hope we all remain curious. I just want to thank the audience for your participation today. You've all been absolutely fantastic, and I hope you'll be back the next two days. I must thank our sponsors for, for allowing GCAP to happen. We couldn't do it without the support of our sponsors. And with that, I thank Unreal Engine, Epic Games, Sledgehammer, EA Fire Monkeys, Creative Victoria, Hipster Whale, Amazon Web Services, League of Geeks, Playside Studios, Fix Screen, Big Ant, Screen Australia, Procreate, Space Draft, Keyword Studios, Blowfish, Cam Rogers Legal, LDB, Screen New South Wales, Screen Queensland, Screen West and the South Australia Film Corporation. So thank you to all of those people. 
We hope to see you all back tomorrow. We are kicking off at 8.30 tomorrow, so I appreciate that's a little bit early, um, but you won't want to miss it. So Zalavia kicks off for us tomorrow. So thank you, everybody. We hope you've enjoyed your, your first day of GCAP. The IGEA team certainly have. And um, see you in the morning. Thank you so much. Thank you.